This is Phil Barassa, and you're listening to Whelm, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, zero, one. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, one, two. Hello team, thanks for joining us for our third installment of Elseworlds, a series brought to you by our backers at Patreon. In Elseworlds, we will be doing deep dives into the amazing catalog of DC animated movies. My name is Rich, and this week I am joined again by my amazing co-host Emily. In this series, we'll be discussing the comics history that inspired the movies, how these stories might have been changed or updated, and in some cases, how they have inspired or will inspire storylines in Young Justice. Maybe not this one, because it's another Maybe. kind of... I have I have a whole thing at the end that was just from a clip. Okay, then. We'll kind see. Fascinating. We'll yeah. see. Uh, but unlike our regular review episodes, we won't be having a Crashing the Mode segment, so consider this your spoiler warning. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on our website, crashingthemode.com, on the yjfiles.tumblr.com, and or at our email address, whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. Whoa, we're just here to help. We don't need help, especially not from you. You think you can hit me? It's been tried before. Don't push us, mister. I see I have your attention. We face a threat big enough to wipe us off the earth and still we bicker about a mask or a uniform. My best friend is lying upstairs right now. She would have given her life for this country and I could hardly look her in the eye. America was founded on the notion that a person should be free to follow his or her destiny. But we can't do that if we're living in fear of our own government. We need to reclaim this country for free men and women everywhere. What about your government, friends? That's a fair question. Superman's right. The persecution and paranoia have to stop. From here on, we work together as free Americans. And with all that housekeeping out of the way, let's hand it off to Emily for... Hello, Megan! Uh, The title of our movie this week is Justice League The New Frontier, which was released on February 26th of 2008. And if I remember correctly, it was the second of the DC animated movies that was released like this? I think it was. Like, it was was early in there trying to do these, like, direct-to-DVD type things. Yeah. Uh, the director was Dave Bullock, and the voice director was Andrea Romano. Woot. Love her. Queen of voice directing. Yeah. Our voice cast is bonkers. <laughs> A little bit. A little bit. This is ridiculous. All right. So David uh, Bornaz, uh, who you might know from Buffy and Angel, played Green Lantern. Uh, Miguel Ferrar, who did the voice of Vandal Savage in Young Justice, is Martian Manhunter. Neil Patrick Harris as The Flash, John Hurd as Ace Morgan, Lucy Lawless as Wonder Woman, Kyle MacLachlan as Superman. I don't even understand that. Uh, Lex Lang as Rick Flagg, Phil Morris as King Faraday, Kira Sedgwick as Lois Lane, Brooke Shields as Carol Ferris, because that's a thing. Yep. Jeremy Sisto as Batman. Um, Yeah. It's an eclectic what? cast. <laughs> it was the early to mid 2000s. It was the mid 2000s. And they were right. just pulling people. And they, they do shields. good. They do good work. I don't yeah. think any of them are yeah. bad in this no. movie. It's no, just they did good. But list. I have to tell you, like when I think Superman, I definitely think Kyle MacLachlan. <laughs> like what? Anyway, he did great. It was it was all good. Uh, yeah, it was just wow. It was quite a. I remember seeing the name uh, Neil Patrick Harris in the credits, and I was like, who's Neil Patrick Harris playing in this? And I got through most of the movie before it clicked in my head. Oh, wait, he's the Flash. Yeah, yeah. I was like, wait, who is Neil Patrick Harris in this? 
Oh, it's Barry. I have to, oh, I have to see it. I have to say he's he's pretty good in that part too because yeah. it's kind of a young. It's a younger, almost Barry, like a, a younger as in inexperienced. Yep. You know, yep. uh, Barry as well, which is pretty cool. It actually comes across really, really yeah. well. Um. All right. Well, let's dive. This has got a lot of stuff happening in this movie. So it's only let's a dive. seventy-five minute movie, and so much <laughs> happens. So much stuff going on, and they cut so much from the comics too. I'll talk about that later. Ooh. But let's, let's dive. Let's dive into this mission briefing. Just in time for your next mission. So, our opening scene for this action-packed seventy-minute film is that we start with a scene of an author writing the backstory of an entity known as the Center. And it's decision that mankind must be destroyed. Because that's what you expect from the opening of yeah. a DC film. Absolutely. Zero chill. Let's just dive in. <laughs> just jump right in. And after finishing writing that story, the author then kills himself. And we hard cut to the credits, <laughs> which reveal the foundation and the disbandment of the Justice Society of America completely just through visuals, which is a real cool way to have your yep. opening credits be entertaining. Uh, we then cut to two American pilots in the Korean War in 1953 who hear over their radios that the war has officially ended in a ceasefire. However, when they're attacked by two other planes, one of the pilots, Hal Jordan, is forced to eject from his own plane and lands in a trench where he is forced to kill another young soldier. Did I mention the zero chill? Yeah. It's PG-13, everybody. <laughs> PG-13. Right <laughs> And we didn't even mention, like, there's the formation and the disbanding of the Justice Society of America, including the death of our man. Yep. Like, there's just, there's a lot going on yep. right after the credits. This is the condensed version, people. <laughs> exactly. Uh, we then cut to the Gotham City Observatory, where a scientist is dying of an apparent heart attack in the arms of a hulking green Martian. The alien, who we'll later learn is, of course, Martian Manhunter, transforms to look like the the now dead scientist and sneaks out into the city. Uh, we then cut to a small village in, into China in 1954, where the no chill continues, <laughs> and Superman finds Wonder Woman doling out freedom and justice <laughs> in her own way. Had to find some way to describe that scene. <laughs> yeah. That's a... Yeah. Um, let's just say Wonder Woman has a very specific view of what justice is, and I don't necessarily disagree with her. Yep. They have a fight about the consequences of vigilante justice in the current global political climate um, before Superman leaves her behind uh, back in the jungle. I'll also mention that um, the scientist that dies mentions that he was trying to contact Mars and somehow his radio contact pulled this Martian to Earth, which is the classic Martian Manhunter origin, which I really like, which makes no sense. Zero sense. Because, yeah, radio waves cause teleportation. Right. That's what I Because he was using Zeta Beam technology to send a signal. I have no idea what's up with that. Comic book science, friends. <laughs> right. Yes. Exactly. So we then go back to Gotham City, where Martian Manhunter continues to pose as a human. And on the top of the Daily Planet, Lois and Superman have a conversation about how the country needs heroes in this current political climate, as we've mentioned already. <laughs> yes. Things are stressful for these characters. <laughs> and then meanwhile, because we have so many cuts to so many characters. <laughs> From one meanwhile to the next meanwhile. <laughs> so many meanwhiles. Iris West is in Las Vegas to conduct an interview with a musician when the casino that she is in is attacked by Captain Cold. But luckily, she was on the phone with Barry Allen during the attack, so the Flash arrives and foils Cold's plan. Just as one does. Uh, however, at the end of that fight, Captain Cold seems to briefly be overtaken by another strange force, referring to people as lesser beings and just generally sounding ominous. Yeah, It'll come back later. And just kept this take on Captain Cold is so interesting to me. He looks like this merging of Captain Cold and like Dr. Savannah from Captain Marvel or something. He's like balding glasses. It's very interesting. Just outside Las Vegas, Hal Jordan and his uh, partner, Ace Morgan, who we saw earlier on in the film, drive into the desert uh, and talk about Hal's post-war hospital stay because he had PTSD after having to shoot this kid. But eventually they arrive at Ferris Aircraft. 
Later, Hal has a job interview with Carol Ferris over dinner where we learn that he was in a psych ward while in uh, the hospital after the war in that particular scene. Meanwhile, Martian Manhunter has apparently become a police detective. While posing as a human, he and his partner go to break up a cult sacrifice only to run into Batman, also trying to break up a cult sacrifice, as, as one does. Um, during the fight, one of the cultists uh, is also seems to be taken over by this same force that Captain Cold was taken over by, mentioning the center and sacrifice, sacrificing the center and generally ominous terribleness, uh, which we heard about during the kind of the film's prologue. Yep. This is such Meanwhile, a, this is such a strange setup. Okay, but we go. There. There's it also works. some time passing too. Yeah, you're right. Like John becomes a police detective, which he which he did originally too. So we never see how, like, how much time was that. Uh, how was that? They only and they only have timestamps on two things, and they're the very beginning to tell us that we're in the Korean War, and then the one yeah. scene with uh, Superman and Wonder Woman is a year later. And we don't know how much time passes between any of the other two scenes that we see in between those and some other stuff. There's the a lot. scene between Superman and Wonder Woman in Indochina was a year after the war? Uh, all we know is that the scene in the Korean War is 1953, and then the timestamp on Indochina says 1954. So it is at least several months later, if not a full year. Interesting. Yeah, um, right, right. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Yeah, the t- I, I don't that. know how much time see. passes in this movie, but it feels like a lot. I know, right? <laughs> it does seem like a lot. But also, All right. it also doesn't feel like enough time at the same time. But we'll get into that later. There's just so much happening right. and no time stamp. We have another. We have another. Meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, back out in Nevada, because <laughs> that's where we're at. Hal Jordan is undergoing flight training exercises because they're doing something out there. Uh, we will find out more later. And afterward, Carol drives him out to a secret underground Ferris aircraft facility. Martian Manhunter's arrival on Earth apparently revealed to the government that there is life on Mars, even if they can't track down John. So now they're trying to just fly to Mars to get some answers, because that is the natural progression. (laughs) Yeah. And back in Gotham, Batman confronts Martian Manhunter in his apartment, and they compare notes on the cult of the center that is apparently spreading across several countries at this point. They decide to work together, but Batman makes it clear that he will not hesitate to kill John if he betrays him. Does he? Does he, I don't remember that. Does he say he's going to kill him? He, he basically says, I think I can trust you. You've made yourself seem trustworthy, but just know yeah. I have a multi-million dollar piece of radioactive rock for the one in Metropolis, and all I need right. for you is a penny to buy a book of matches. And then he swings yeah, out the window, true. and I'm like, hi, that was a fantastic Batman insult, threat, whatever you want to call it. And like, yeah. that's an I didn't escalation. see that as a death threat. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I didn't see that as a death threat. Whatever. A subduing threat. He's willing to take him it's down, true. however you want to he take it. He is definitely willing. Yes, that's fair. But I was like, did I miss a part where he said he was going to murder this guy? <laughs> I may have extrapolated. But here's here's that's your fair. full context, listeners. Yes. And this was when you're reading Martian Manhunter back in the day, you were like, he's every, he's got all the superpowers. And unless there's a candle in the room. <laughs> like, I... I it was just a weird bit of character design back in the All day. All you gotta to do you. is take Martian Manhunter to Yankee Candle, and he's powerless. Right. <laughs> you win automatically. I hope it's not around Christmas time because that Yule log will kill him. <laughs> yeah, it's just really interesting. Anyway, meanwhile, we think maybe later. We're not sure. In Central City, the Flash faces off with Gorilla Grodd. But then the government tries to abduct the Flash uh, for what they imply is research. Luckily, Barry manages to escape, and back in the Gotham Police Department, John Jones uh, interrogates a scientist who claims that the center is going to kill everyone and that the government is planning to, quote-unquote, escape to Mars. Um, this was the scientist we saw earlier in the movie who was tr- doing doodles of the of the center, oh. uh, but working working with Ferris. I watched Airlines. this film twice and I didn't realize that. <laughs> yeah, it was a quick thing. Like 
I think Faraday or somebody yeah. or Rick Flagg comes by him and says something. He's like, oh, everything's fine. And yep. then you look down and he's doodling. I noticed the doodling. Hor- I did horror not horror realize it was the same guy. Yeah. So uh, Faraday, King Faraday, uh, an agent for the U.S. government, arrives to collect the scientist, claiming that everything he's said about Mars is nonsense. But of course, Martian Manhunter is able to read King Faraday's thoughts and see that it's actually all true. And then, of course, wants to return to Mars himself. That night, the Flash interrupts the current news broadcast to announce that he's apparently quitting being a superhero to protect the people he cares about. And in Gotham, Batman's research on the center is interrupted by Martian Manhunter, who gives him his evidence and announces that he's leaving the planet to go back to Mars because there's too much hate and ignorance here on Earth, apparently. The next day out in Nevada, uh, Martian Manhunter tries to stow away on the Ferris rocket ship, but is captured by Faraday. Yeah, kind of. I'm like, what had happened in that? How did he capture him? Oh, wait. Faraday was going to die, <laughs> and Martian Manhunter saved his life, okay. right? That's Probably. I may have, I've, again, I watched this twice, but things happen oh. fast. Sorry, I wasn't trying to correct. I was trying to remember, because I'm like, how did Faraday stop Martian I Manhunter? I couldn't remember. Oh, right. And then there was, like, fire again. A lot happens in this movie. A lot happens fast. And you're trying to follow both <laughs> what is happening with Hal Jordan in this scene right. on this rocket ship and right. whatever's happening with Martian Manhunter. And Martian Manhunter right. stuff has no dialogue and is all just visual. So I'm like, wait, who's where? What's happening? Right. And it just ends with Martian Manhunter like, gets captured, which is the important thing that you need to know from that scene. Right. But I want to talk about that scene a little bit in a bit, too, because I'm a com- the scene confuses me a little bit. Um. Okay, <laughs> now we figured out how Faraday managed to passively capture Martian Manhunters with his own unconscious body. <laughs> All right, so Hal Jordan's rocket makes it into space, but a malfunction causes them to lose propulsion and start falling back toward Earth. Hal insists that he can land them safely, but Rick Flagg says that it'll be too dangerous because they're carrying um, biological and nuclear weapons on board. Surprise! Hey, whoop! Uh, Hal says that's a terrible idea. What's wrong with you? Um, knocks him unconscious before he can hit the self destruct button, and tries to get the rocket uh, landed back on Earth. Um, Flag wakes up and ejects Hal into space. Um, but by that time, um, Faraday has Faraday and Carol Ferris have realized what's happened, and they've called in Superman. Apparently, you can just do who that. Who arrives? Yeah, apparently. Well, Faraday can. <laughs> Because he's, I guess, because he signed like a contract or something, right? Yes. I, I think that was something earlier, him and Wonder yes. Woman. So Superman tries to save them both, but he's able to save Hal and get him back to Earth, but he can't get to Flag, Rick Flag, before he self destructs the rocket and dies yep. in orbit. And like, he's trying to do it to save Earth, but it's complicated. It's a complicated mm-hmm. scene. It's complicated. Uh, it's complicated. Yes. And back on Earth, we then uh, cut to Themyscira, where Wonder Woman and the Amazons are attacked by a giant looming shadow. And we don't see what it is. It just shows up, and Wonder Woman pulls out a sword, and then we cut back to Nevada. But it's important to know it's happening. Uh, Hal is then uh, dragged into the desert in Nevada by a strange green force. It just takes him. Uh, there he meets a dying alien who is apparently coming to the planet to assist with the coming battle with the center. But before he dies, he bestows the power of the Green Lantern on Hal Jordan. We then cut over to Gotham, where Superman and Batman discuss what they each know about the center when they hear a radio broadcast about a giant pterodactyl, one of the monsters from the book about the center, attacking Cape Canaveral. Superman is able to stop the creature, but immediately afterward, an injured Wonder Woman crash lands at the Cape and tells Superman that whatever attacked the mascara is coming here next. And Wonder Woman is like bleeding enough that you can see the inside of the invisible jet. So like a lot (laughs) happened apparently from whatever is coming. The cockpit of the invisible jet is just covered in blood. I'm like that's an the invisible interesting. Jet also, doesn't make interesting any sense. artistic yes. choice so that we know why she's flying, but also that's a right. lot of blood. Right, right, and she can fly in this too. 
So can it she? always brings up that question. Oh, yeah, of like, no, she can. Yeah, because she flies later on. Yeah, there's a scene later on that she she's flying as can well. Can she so. fly long distances? Um, is she like a is she a flying well, sprinter, not a flying marathoner? Maybe that's well, why she and that's one of the things. Like, well, it people always bring that up, but I'm just like, yeah, well, you can walk, <laughs> but you have a car. Like, she can fly, but why would she want to? F- Maybe it's exhausting. We don't know. We'll get, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. Right. Uh, also, classic Hal Jordan um, origin, which is great too. He was even in the like test, <laughs> the, the test pilot thing that he was in the original origin. Meanwhile, uh, back in Nevada, again in Nevada, Faraday talks with Martian Manhunter and invites him to help with the ongoing conflict. Uh, Hal Jordan, The Flash, and several other outlawed heroes arrive at Cape Canaveral to help with the coming fight as well. The government refuses to work with them, even tries to arrest them, (laughs) shooting Flash, which sounds like a terrible idea. But Superman breaks up the infighting to remind everyone that they need to work together. He then flies out to do some recon on the impending attack, which is a giant floating monster carrying island thing, but is attacked by the creatures it's carrying and seemingly killed during the fight. The remaining heroes and government officials come up with a plan involving Ray Palmer's shrinking technology because he's also here because this movie right. has everyone. <laughs> right, right. It, it has everyone and also still manages to have about half of the people that are in the actual comic. We'll get to it. <laughs> it's uh, so many people in the comic. And they are apparently going to try to use this technology to destabilize the monster because Ray Palmer's tech works but immediately blows up anything that it shrinks. But blows up stuff, (laughs) right. The next morning, they put this plan into action with everyone fighting side by side. But during this fight, Agent Faraday is killed. But Wonder Woman rallies the troops to keep the monsters distracted until Hal and the Flash can take it down. Because Wonder Woman is out of commission for most of this and then shows up halfway through to be incredible uh hal is almost killed while dropping bombs inside of the giant monster island thing because that's the plan mm-hmm. uh b- psychedelic giant monster thing we gotta put psychedelic yes, in because it too, has the yeah. power to change the art style <laughs> the greatest power <laughs> in any animated film <laughs> wow uh, that's my next mask character by the way <laughs> oh but Hal Jordan then taps into his new Green Lantern abilities to save both himself and Ace Morgan. They make it out alive after doing some major damage, and then the Flash is then able to run in and fully destabilize the creature known as the Center. Uh, Green Lantern then contains the explosion and throws it into space, where it can explode without hurting anyone. Because nobody thought that a giant explosion might be a problem on Earth. But they went with it, and then Green Lantern threw it yeah. into space. Well, it was over the ocean, but then it was just like, oh, I'm going to blow up. I'm coming at you. <laughs> They're like, oh, it was, it's coming right and at us. Like, now what do we sometimes do? Sometimes throw it into space is an exaggeration. No, Hal Jordan literally just throws it into space. Literally. <laughs> right. No, no, very dramatically. They duplicate that shot from the comic quite well. Uh, and then back on Earth after a space-throwing explosion, uh, with the center officially defeated, And the Earth saved. An underwater vessel arrives on the beach at Cape Canaveral and out walks Aquaman. Don't get me started with the metal submarine Atlantis thing. (laughs) Uh, Carrying an injured but very much alive Superman who reunites with Lois. And everyone celebrates. Yay! (laughs) We end with a montage of the future struggles, triumphs, and the iconic moments of the DC heroes set to excerpts of John F. Kennedy's famous acceptance speech at the 1960 Democratic National Convention. Fun history fact for which you was, all. Which was, which is pretty great. And there's so much going on in those cuts. It's a real good end ending montage. It's super good. We'll get into it. Pun intended. All right. Let's get into some master. Because I, I definitely have some master in Same this. here. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. So when we picked this one, we picked it at least in part because both me and Rich really love period dramas. Mm-hmm. We like our historical fiction. Yes, we do. It's real fun. We do. So it's really interesting to see this as a historical take on the Justice League because it's not a story that was written in the 60s or this was a story that was written 50s. Yeah, 50s. Sorry, my bad. Uh, I'm just saying like it's around that. Yeah, it was written later. So it is 
technically a period drama and was made much later. So this is a 2008 take on a story set in the 60s that wasn't written in the 60s. And I think that's really interesting. And there's so many layers to this, too, because because of the weirdness, the timey wimeyness of comics. <laughs> OK, so it, it was written in 2008. The movie was about uh, the movie was written in 2008 uh, and the comic was written several years before that. I can't remember when that came out. Um, and it's telling a period piece about characters in the 1950s, except it can use the characters as they were represented in the 1950s because they actually existed then, including around the, the mid to late 1950s and early 60s is when they revamped all of these characters. Yes. So it's when the original Alan Scott Green Lantern, um, you know, took a step, stepped out and then the Hal Jordan high tech Green Lantern came in or the Jay Garrick stepped out and the new, you know, the future heroes. So it's this weird yet yeah, period piece, but homage to actual things that happened. Like Green Arrow's outfits the same, like as it used to be. Like this is the this is the the classic Martian Manhunter origin, the classic Hal Jordan origin. Like it's this it's so I mean, interesting to me going over real quick to wikipedia which is a helpful resource for some of this stuff it was published in 2004 like we were saying so four years before they decided to make it into the film um and it was intended basically to bridge the gap between the end of the golden age and the beginning of the silver age so it was all of right. those changing over moments that they decided to make a series kind of dealing with all of those changing over moments and set it during the cold what's War. interesting during the during in the comic too, which yes. I'll get into a little bit yeah, more detail, but the there's a whole part. there's a whole scene with Doctor Fate and the Spectre, who we've talked about on the show, which are just like reality bending heroes that were in the Justice Society along with like the Sandman who like sprayed people with the sleep gas. Yep. Right. Yep. And our our man who was like really at, he was like Captain America, but only like an hour at a time. So you've got those two guys in in some other in some other dimension having lunch with Phantom Stranger, Zatanna, and Billy Batson, talking about how reality was going to be destroyed potentially, and the center might wipe the whole planet of Earth uh, of humans. But that's okay. Life will life will go on. And Phantom Stranger saying like, "You guys bowed out. You you were just a society, and you bowed out. I don't know why you would bow out, you godlike beings, but." You did. And so now these new heroes are going to be have to be who saves the world. Like it's it's a real specific theme addressed in a really weird way. Yeah. In the comic. We'll get into more so, of the comic later. Yeah. But oh, so speaking much. of the comic, the comic was drawn by the same person who was kind of a creative consultant and producer and additional writer on the film, uh, which yeah. also borrowed his art style from the comic. And I love his art style. I love Darwin Cook's art. It is so distinctive and so cool. And it has this wonderful vintage quality to it that works for the, yeah. this story. We we joked a little bit about how the the art feels a little little deceptive in that like it can come off as right. kind of cartoony and childish. And then you're like, this is a PG right. rate, PG thirteen rated film that's gonna do PG thirteen things. You're, ex you're expecting it to be uh, Norman Rockwell, yes. and then Hal Jordan shoots this guy kid in the head, and you're just like, hey. or the opening scene is a is a writer committing yeah. suicide. So keep these things in mind when you're watching this yes. show. Like it's PG thirteen. It's not R like Gotham by Gaslight, but uh, it doesn't hold pull back punches either. But Norman, Norman Rockwell is a really good comparison, actually, since a lot of Norman Rockwell's art is also a lot darker than people think. Uh, people assume Norman Rockwell's stuff is all very light and happy, but a lot of his stuff was very political and very lot... Reflective of yeah. the times. And, Hi, yeah, I've been to the Norman absolutely. Rockwell Museum twice, and this is the second time he's come up on Weld. Oh, yeah? Only twice? <laughs> they came up in the comics one time. Probably. <laughs> oh, no, I remember. <laughs> Dumb tangents. Getting back on track to this movie <laughs> that we're actually talking Meanwhile, about. back to the Meanwhile, episode. Meanwhile, back to the episode. Um, we're not in Nevada. <laughs> not in Nevada. We also... We... Why am I saying we? I also... Why not? Me personally. My personal opinion. 
I also really enjoyed how they do all of those slow character intros at the beginning because they don't dump everyone Mm -hmm. on us at once. They don't give us the entire Justice Society or the entire what will be the Justice League. You are slowly discovering these characters. And like Green Lantern isn't Green Lantern until the last 20 minutes of the movie. (laughs) Like, yeah, he is Hal Jordan for most of this film. And a lot of it is framed as really cool. Like, where are they now moments that give this movie a really nice continuity of it feels like there is a history behind each of these characters. Mm -hmm. No one's introduction in this film is like, except for Martian Manhunter, is their first time in this universe, is their first time being a hero. None of them have that. Like. Our introduction to Wonder Woman and Superman is that they have both known each other for years, have a relationship, and have their own disagreements and moral codes set up already. (laughs) And we're just... There's the door, Spaceman. Oh, it's so good. (laughs) I love that line. (laughs) And going from that, I love this film's take on Wonder Woman. I love it. Yeah, me too. Because she's like... She's human, but she's not quite human, and she has her own distinct moral code, and she is so set in who she is and what she's doing and questioning everything around her and, like, has her great line when she's on Themyscira where she's explaining what America's like, and she says, it's changed so much since the war. We were in the right then. And it's, like, just that idea of, like, this is how Wonder Woman views the world and how she views the world she's a part of. And as a small note, they drew her as taller than Superman, and that made me smile. Like, yes, she is an Amazon. Taller and bigger than Superman. Like, because this is like the old school classic Superman that's was kind of small. (laughs) He wasn't. He wasn't this big, giant, ripped, you know, He Man. And he, I mean, he didn't have the skin tight suit either. They kind of draw that Darwin cookie you know, way where he's got like this jammers or whatever he's wearing, you know? All the guys um, have But shorts. like Wonder Wonder Woman in the, right? The Wonder Woman in the scene where they're in Indochina, man, I'm just like, she's ta- she's looking down at Clark having this conversation. Is, I'm like, this is, this is awesome. Which is so good from so many reasons. Like it's great as a character design. It's great in the context of that scene of just that visual language of like, Wonder Woman is looking down on Superman in this scene and like that carries weight and that's just fantastic. That whole scene is real good. Well, I wanted to, I wanted to reflect a little bit on what you just said about this idea of how, of, of them having created this world that felt lived in before we got there. And it it just echoes right back to what, you know, um, uh, Lucas and I were talking about in our recent discussion episode, talking about the levels of how do you do this? How do you create a world that's felt lived in? We talked about it in Reflection of Young Justice and comics like Yusagi Yojimbo and that kind of stuff. But you're now doing a movie that's an adaptation of a comic. And the comic, you think there's a lot going on in this movie. The comic has got twice as much stuff going on in the background. And so you're trying to trim all that down, but also make it feel real in some way. Like, can, like, you got you to gotta make it feel like there's an activity going on. You can't just say like, oh, well, th- there's a war. Okay, well, now I guess we're starting with the war and Hal Jordan or whatever. No, they took it a step back and said, look, we need to get a lot of data and info dump in here. How do we do this? And they show like the whole, like uh, almost like inc- in- Incredibles yeah. movie kind it of thing where the government is, right, getting into the Justice Society and then the whole like, you know, death of our man, which, you know, and this, this all this stuff, but they do it all in the credits. How they cool give is you that? Barry's entire backstory in three seconds of the credits because they right. show like scientist, broken chemicals, lightning bolt, man lightning runs bolt. fast. And I'm like, that's all yeah. we really need to know. <laughs> right. Exactly. And and there's that there's that the skill that it takes is that both an artist like a nod to, you know, to Darwin Cook and the animators to be able to go like, look, there's a lot going on with Barry in this movie. And it's interesting to me. But what is the essence of who he is? What is what is the you know what's what's the Nike swoosh kind of thing that you can put up there that's iconic that you can look at and go like oh Flash is in this movie and they're doing the class there's nothing strange or unusual it's the classic Barry chemicals lightning bolt origin we're not doing a hot take on Barry Allen yeah. right. And this movie, I love it. This movie doesn't do like any hot takes, except for a few, a nope. little bit with Green Lantern, which I really like that we'll go into. But it's true they do, and then they re. I mean, for those people who've watched Young Justice, everyone, 
Um, Hopefully. King King Faraday makes an appearance in Young Justice as well. He's in the episode uh, with uh, Haley's Circus. And he is the, he's the FBI agent that shows up and he's following the circus through Europe. I just learned that. Do you remember? <laughs> oh, yeah. Like I knew so that's, that, that's but King... it hadn't connected in my mind that those are the same people. Right. You're completely right. So that's fascinating. Yeah, Faraday shows up and he's like, he's talking to to Haley and he's like, look, you know, this is what's been happening and what's going on and we're following you around and there's, you know, that kind of stuff. So there's different takes on King Faraday as well. This take on them being friends, him and Martian Manhunter eventually becoming friends and and that King Faraday has this, there's a scene where Martian Manhunter, he's at, Faraday's saying, why are you still here? You can clearly walk through walls and fly and destroy everyone. Why are you still in this cage? And he, he, jokes about that he wants to beat Faraday at chess without having to read his mind. But then he gets serious and he says, I looked inside your mind and I see what you're doing inside you. You are hoping for a day in which none of this is necessary, where there is a time of peace. And if someone like you can feel that way, that gives me hope for humanity. And I'm like, that has never been a take of King Faraday to me. And I love that, that deep down seed of wanting to be the hero of his own story when King Faraday is often at least an antagonist, if not an outright like villain in some cases. So really cool take. Yeah. With that, like we were talking, uh, I mentioned that the only the only hot take that stood out to me because I don't I don't know anything about King Faraday. I'm learning uh, was that in this because. It is set in the Cold War, and they have given every character a bit of a Cold War flavor without changing much. It's really interesting. They gave Hal Jordan PTSD from the Korean War, and they have made it clear that Mm -hmm. he has that or possibly some other form of mental illness, but it reads largely as PTSD. It seems to be talked about as that. Uh, But he's still being seen as the man on earth with the most willpower simply because he believes all life is worth protecting and adding yep. that as just, you're not just the man who can control the green lantern. You are that despite and because of everything that other people have told you is wrong is fantastic. Uh, Ace Morgan at the beginning, um, when they get attacked by the Korean fighter pilots, um, he says, I'll come back for you because Ace Morgan's plane is pretty tor- torn up um, and he flies off and Ace is like, try to use your guns this time. And you're like, he's gone through, he's gone through this entire war and not used his guns on his, but he's taken planes down. What? And then you see him like doing his fancy flying stuff and like confusing these guys and, you know, startling and scaring them so that they run into each other and they can whatever. So I'm like, okay, that's interesting. And then, you find out he gets through the entire war without killing with as far as he knows without directly shooting and murdering someone right killing someone in war until the very end when the war is technically almost over and the war is actively and he gets attacked over. by a it's te- and the war is act yeah like it's not it's almost technically over, over. It's yeah technically right over. sorry you're right you're you are correct I, I i definitely misspoke it's over it's been announced and in the comic where he's where he's in the movie, he's saying, you know, it's over, the war's over, and he's repeating that over and over again, even after he shot this, obviously a kid. I, I don't want to call it a kid, but that he was clearly a kid, right? So he kills his kid. Right. And so he's saying over and over again, the war is over, the war is over, the war is over. In the comic, during that same scene, which is very similar to what we see, when they pick him up, he actually gets rescued. He actually gets rescued and pulled up by Lois and Jimmy, actually, who were in a helicopter reporting on what was going on. And they pull him up and he's 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 saying that, but he's he's saying it in Korean. So they're, they actually wrote it in Korean. And she's like, what is he saying? And one of the pilots says he's saying oh, he's saying the war's over over and over again in Korean, which puts like a whole new layer Of like, holy crap. Like he, it wasn't that he spoke English like in the movie and the kid couldn't understand him in the, in the comic, he's telling the kid it's over and the kid is not registering it or whatever. Like he's doing everything he possibly can to not have to kill this kid to save himself. Right. Yep. And then later on in the movie is talking about being a coward, which would have been a huge conversation topic back in the day. Right. Why were you, why are you a coward? And he's like, I'm, I'm. He's he's clearly not. He's clearly not a coward. He just doesn't want to kill people. He's a pacifist. 
right? Even even Carol seems to get really like bent out of shape because she's just like discovered that he's that the reason what happened and why he was in the hospital and that, you know. And she doesn't and she doesn't even seem to be mad that he didn't technically she doesn't to me that scene doesn't read as like i can't believe you never killed anyone in the war it reads as i can't believe you never killed anyone in the war and you're running into this fight you're a person who doesn't want to fight and you're running towards this and she just doesn't get right. it there is a tinge of like i'm kind of shocked you got through the korean war without killing anyone but right but she does get like she's like what do you think you're going yes. to do yeah right and he's like you know what i found out i found out why i would kill and I would kill for survival, and that's what that's what this is. It's so it's, so, it's good, it's really good. It's real good. Yeah, it's real good. And when you have an ensemble cast, like echoing to Young Justice, we talk about this all the time. The fact that you've got an ensemble cast that you're getting, you you have to distill these things down into character defining moments. You're with so many characters, you cannot have your scenes only doing one thing. They have to carry multiple, multiple things for your plot and character development story and all that stuff. Every scene has got to do more than one thing, right? For every character or, or it's, it's either boring or you're not going to get everything in or somebody's not going to feel flushed out, you know? So yeah, crazy, crazy stuff. Going back just a little bit. I wanted to point out that I have a comic book history Easter egg for everyone for once. (laughs) I have one guys. Because I saw something and when I need to research that right now. Uh, There is a scene where Batman is going over like a slideshow of news clippings and magazine covers and stuff. And some of it is historical events that kind of tie into the themes of the movie. And some of it is stuff related to the center. But there's one photo that is several soldiers gathered around. And it says this at the very top of it. It says, this is the story of the losers, and then has a little paragraph under it that you can pause and read, and I did. Um, And I then went to the internet and started researching, as you do. And it turns out that the losers, that name, were actually an actual team that appeared in war comics set during World War II that were published by DC in the 70s using characters from the 50s and 60s, which I think, think, saying it out loud now, even adds a further level to this period drama thing and that they were not they were characters created in the 50s and 60s set during the 40s and how that was cold war era commentary on previous wars and then they were written as a full team in the 70s when we were looking back even further at all of the things that we had done in these types of wars and tying that and those ideas because if i'm remembering correctly the concept behind the losers was they were all technically soldiers from war comics who ended up in a group together because they'd all failed on some sort of mission and then were thrown into a group, if I'm remembering my research correctly right now. And including yeah. that, even just as a little tonal Easter egg into everything that this movie is saying, is really interesting to me. Because this yeah. this movie, among everything that it's talking about, despite being 75 minutes, a lot is happening here largely is about the importance of teamwork and working with other people and how a lot of war is really bad because this is a Cold War era thing where we were thinking about that a lot in America. Yeah, for sure. Um, There were, so I grew up, so I talked about how I learned how to read on Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes in the 70s. The comics that my brother collected were Weird War Tales, Superboy, Legion and the Super and Legion of Superheroes, and Sergeant Rock and Easy Company. So these things were pretty common, written commonly written in the sixties and seventies. Yeah. Um, for some reason, there was like a, a nostalgia and a reflection and an analysis of of World War Two. It was still very. It was twenty five years. It's only been twenty five years from it was you know, the, the day I was born. It was born, the thirty so. year cycle, basically. Where there's right. the idea yeah, that exactly. things are nostalgic 30 years after they happen. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and they had the losers. Oh, the other thing. So there was Weird War Tales also had the Haunted Tank, um, which was... Uh, was a yeah, haunted it, tank? It's a whole thing. The haunt, it was a haunted tank. It was, it was a tank that was haunted by the ghost of Ulysses S. Grant, I want to say. 
I have to think about that again. Um, so there were a lot of these characters. And so when I was first reading this, I was like, they're calling them the losers, but is this Easy Company? Because they did, Easy Company was Sergeant Rock too. So I don't know if there was some crossovers with a bunch of these different things, but... I think um, there was. Because it was kind of a thing in these comics that characters, even though they had, you know, real names, they would be given nicknames, right? So like the youngest member of... Sergeant Rock and Easy Company was the ice. They called him the Ice Cream Soldier because he just he was eighteen, but he looked like he was you know fifteen or sixteen, right? Or Jigsaw, who's you know his his whole shtick was is that he would carve out of wood puzzles while they were out doing stuff and pictures of his his people. But the other thing about these comics were they died, <laughs> like. They they didn't like, oh, it's Easy Company and it's Easy Company from issue one to issue whatever. No, people died all the time. So it was pretty poignant in a lot of these cases. So to see the losers in this, um, I had to go back and do a little research because I just, I, my life was all Sergeant Rock and that yeah, kind of stuff. But share. one of the main characters was uh, Johnny Cloud, who's, they were calling, he kept making references in the comic, in the actual comic of this. The, that thing that you were reading is like the intro to the whole comic, right? And so when they talk about there's there's actually uh, a, I don't know if the newspaper clippings at the beginning of the movie or if it's in that scene you're talking about, but there's a reference to when they say oh there was um, there was a, a, a soldier got lost on this uh, found this island with dinosaurs on it, but not only were there no dinosaurs, there were no there's no island. That's when right? Martian Manhunter was like a, watching TV near the beginning right, of the film. Right, exactly. That soldier that was on there was Rick Flagg. And so, and the losers. And I'll, I'll get into some other things that are crossovers there too. But uh, yeah, the 70s, you're right. The 30-year cycle thing, right? The nostalgia thing, right? Because there's a lot of war movies that came out in the 70s there's and stuff too. There's a lot too, written so. about the 30-year cycle of nostalgia. If people want to go do research on that. It's a real thing. It's really interesting, actually. It's why the 80s are yeah. getting pretty big right now. Uh, 80s are big now and 90s will be coming. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. But aside from all of that and all that pretty heavy stuff, fun fact for everyone, minor voice acting fun fact, <laughs> the television news anchor in this, uh, who is the one that Flash interrupts, uh, is played by Jeff Bennett, who four years after this in 2012 did almost the exact same voice when playing the radio announcer in Legend of Korra. And I needed to share with people because when I heard it, I was like, it can't possibly be the same guy. It sounds just like him, but it's probably just somebody else doing an old timey radio voice. And then I Googled it and I'm like, it's the same guy. And that made me I smile. Love that guy. So I wanted to share that with everyone else because it's a real good old timey radio voice. And apparently he's gotten hired multiple times to do that voice. Right. He's in he's in the booth with me now. <laughs> he's aiming his glove at me. I am wetting my pants. I love that guy. So it's, good. He's a real it's good so guy, funny. and there's a reason that they have him do all of the previously yeah. on Legend of Korra, because oh, everybody knew. And, he's and the you know best. what? That that particular episode of Legend of Korra two was the one where um, the it, there's so much stuff happens in that one episode. Yes. It's so full of action, and um, oh god, her, why is her name? It's giving uh, Toff's daughter, Lynn Lynn Beifong. Lynn Beifong. Beifong is like, oh, look, Batman showed up. <laughs> and Lin Beifong just destroys everybody. She's so good in that episode. I just rewatched that fight scene over and over and over again. It's so good. It's real good. She's so good. Oh, I love but it. Anyway, we can go off on Legend of Korra, but let's Getting we'll back, back to the movie at we'll hand. I do have a couple of critiques that I will throw out, and we can get back to talking about how fun this movie is, because it is real good. It's a really good movie. But it took me till the very end of this film somehow to realize that Wonder Woman is the only female superhero in the entire film. It is an ensemble cast with a lot of people and you have Carol and you have Iris and you have Lois like as supporting characters. But I would have liked for some of the other classic female superheroes to get thrown in. Mm -hmm. Like I would have liked Canary being thrown in there because we have Green Arrow and I feel like we could have thrown in Black Canary in that group shot or just somebody into the final battle. I know we've got a lot of characters, but it would have made me happy. 
And that's not a big yeah. critique. The film is not bad because of that. It is just something I noticed right. and wanted to point out. Because Wonder Woman is fantastic and all of the supporting female characters are are great in their own ways. Just would have been nice. Yeah. Um and there were there were people to use. Yes. Um That's part. So there's a so there's a there's a scene I was gonna talk about at the end. There's a shot that I find really interesting we, we, in the that credits. montage. Yeah. I have feelings about that yeah. montage. <laughs> So there's a shot where that's obviously the Teen Titans. Yes. And it's this ver this universe's version of the Teen Titans. And there's so much going on in just this one pan one one pan. <laughs> yes. Right? So you got the classics, right? So you got Robin, you got Speedy, you got Kid Flash, you've got Donna Troy, Wonder Girl, you and you've got um Garth Aqualad. In addition to that, you also have Supergirl and Black Canary. Right? Yeah. And so I'm I'm looking at this and I'm thinking like, oh, the time frame that they're thinking about here and how things are set up, Carol would be perfect for the Teen Titans at that time and makes perfect sense to me that she would be there. And Black Canary was originally a Justice Society member and then she kind of got switched and rebooted a bit, but then they kind then they split her into two people and said, look, there was a black, a non-powered Black Canary that was a member of the Justice Society and her daughter developed the canary cry and became the second black canary, which would be perfect for this, where the where her mom, who had been black canary during World War II um, in the Justice Society, that had all been disbanded. But then she, as a kid, grows up to be right the perfect age to become a member of the, the Titans. I, I would love to read that comic. I would too. And having freaking Donna Troy and Kara on the same team, like your two heavy hitting powerhouses. That would be real good. Oh, uh, super good. Oh, um, man, we go so good. Me and not to be predictable, my mind is always like, okay, but you got to have Black Canary be around the same age as Green Arrow because them, but... Well, yeah, but, but yeah. that's... That's, it, that's, it, no, it, that's, basi- that's it's, it's basically the same thing. It's exactly the same thing that happened with Zatanna and the team. Yeah, no, because I get it. I get it. Zatanna is classically older than Dick. So, like... You know what I yeah. mean? So you you if you're looking at it, and this is the thing, like you're trying to create this world, look at what works and what makes sense. Yeah. Right? For that world that you happen to be creating. And if if we're gonna look at it and say, like, if you're not gonna say that that Zatara was a mentor from the Justice Society, if you're gonna say Zatara is on the team on the Justice League, then that just re Yeah, yeah. no, I totally agree. shifts everything else. And like once you have said all of this out loud, and again, I knew a lot of that about Black Canary, but it did not click in my mind that that's what they were doing because I am yeah. so used to Black Canary being older and having Black Canary as this adult hero that my mind was like, why is this adult superhero with the Teen Titans? And now that you've said all this out loud, I'm like, you had all of these yeah. facts and didn't put them together, Emily. What are you doing? That's a fantastic <laughs> idea. Um, oh, there's so many Easter yes. eggs in this thing too. But I love Kara's outfit too, where it goes all the way up to her neck, <laughs> like it covers her up. It's one of her old outfits from back in the day. It just, it's so Let good. Kara wear a real shirt. Um, yeah. Yes. Also, Kara. let Kara be Kara. What? <laughs> let Kara be Kara. Yes. Not a bad carbon copy of Clark that makes no sense. We're not getting into it. Uh, okay, I'm just saying. Okay. Anyway, final note from me. Uh, is a little it's kind of two notes wrapped into one but so this film is an ensemble film and it is as we've said it is an ongoing <laughs> has lot. its whole history which makes it feel a little bit cluttered and a little bit scattered sometimes we had to have meanwhiles inside of meanwhiles for our <laughs> for our dis- description of this movie so like I definitely wouldn't recommend it as anyone's first introduction to the Justice League or the DC Universe in Anyway, if I was going to be like, hey, you want to learn about superheroes and I showed somebody this, they'd be like, I am so confused. What do you mean there are strange cult entities and why does everyone already know each other? What's anybody's backstory? I'd be like, yeah, no, wrong movie to start somebody on. But because it is a story that is in motion and has all these characters that have really strong, concrete relationships, it knows how to deliver an emotional punch. This movie, like that opening scene where Hal has to mm-hmm. shoot a teenage soldier in the face, I gasped out loud 
because I was shocked and horrified as I was meant to be. And it was a film that sets it up so that that feels like a lot. Like a lot of other films could have made that not feel as painful and brutal as it is. But this film makes it painful and brutal, even though it is an animated movie or people might think you can't do that in an animated film. You can. And it hurts. And like I teared up when Lois Lane breaks down on the news when she has to tell everyone that Superman is dead and is trying to keep it together. And she just can't. And she breaks down. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'm fine. This is fine. Everything's fine here. And I legitimately started just crying during the montage because it is so well delivered for the emotional beats it is trying to deliver in that montage of these just quick moments that are no dialogue, just the playing of that speech that is iconic and carries so much emotion with it set to like the new forming of the Justice Society of the Justice League of America and the Teen Titans. Mm-hmm. And there's one quick shot where they pan over a classroom and a kid is reading an essay that is just entitled My Hero. And if you look at it, because you can read what it says because it's short enough and it lingers on it, it is just says by Rick Flagg Jr. My dad is my hero. He's also named Rick. He fought in the war. And it's this whole thing. And I'm like, I'm fine. I'll just sit here and cry. Because it's this beautiful emotional catharsis at the end of this movie that has a lot going on. And some of it's overblown, silly. We're going to fight a monster and throw it into space. And some of it is brutal war commentary. And it ends with this hope and this just emotional center of this film. And it's real good. It's real good. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Hi, Emily has emotions I, a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yes, we do. Um. I got a lot of stuff too. Rich, share share your feelings. We're not even done. We're not even done. No. You're talking about that. The scene right before the Rick Flag talking about his dad as a hero scene yes. is uh. John Wilson. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, right. Yep. Yep. Right. Who's an African American vigilante in the comic, in this set comic. And he is mentioned in this film early on. Right. And he dies. Uh so his his family was murdered by a Ku Klux Klan and he was hung. He managed to survive. He didn't die. They ran they everybody murdered his family and then rode off and he survived and became a vigilante, uh, carrying these two hammers and he ended up he ended up getting shot and hurt and he crawled into crawled into a nearby home or into the yard of a nearby home and uh, a little young white girl was there and he asked her for help and she turned him in so and then he was burned to death and this is all comics right all the comics history for him they yeah that well they don't he, go into own, that much char- detail in the film of telling it. Just, right. Just and, they, and they go into this they go into this detail in the specific comic okay. New Frontier, but John Wilson only exists in New Frontier. Ah. But the scene right before the one you're talking about with Rick Flagg Jr. is John Henry Irons sitting next to who who is the character of Steel, who's sitting next to the, you know, the the headstone of John Wilson. And he, you can see it says irons right across the, the back of his jersey. Uh, so it's just like, oh, God, there's there's so much going on in just that. And then you've got the whole John Kennedy speech going on over top of it. Oh, it's just it's so good. Um, it's real good. But anyway, I'm, I got I to gotta back it up a little Go bit. Go for it. There's a bunch of stuff Go going on. It. You'll notice toward, at the end of the movie, Ace Morgan and, and other people in the background are wearing these weirdly weird purple shirts. Yes. Do you remember that? Yes, yes. So Ace Morgan is one of the founding members of a group called the Challengers of the Unknown. <laughs> and when I saw him at the end in the purple shirt, I was like, that looks like a Challengers of the Unknown uniform. And then I look later on and you actually see June, who's another one of the Challengers of the Unknown in the background. And then in the comic I'll talk about, she's actually has a plays a plays a bigger role. And the Challengers of the Unknown have a much bigger role as well. And they're basically a team of adventurers. They're kind of like the Fantastic Four crossed with Indiana Jones, you know, kind of thing without like superpowers. 
right? And they would travel around and, you know, fight mysteries and, you know, discover and uncover things. Um, They're pretty cool. I liked the comic back in the day. But it's interesting to me that they had, that's a classic thing. And they showed all of these classic characters, right? So they'd show like Adam Strange, you know, in his old original costume. So again, echoes of season two of Young Justice, you see Adam Strange there, right? Um, the Adam clearly hadn't become the Adam yet, right? But um, there's the scene where all the scientists are sitting around talking. I, I know this happened in the comic, but I didn't go back to rewatch the scene. There's one of a, one of the characters is in a wheelchair. Yes. And that's that's Niles Calder, who's the founder of the Doom Patrol, right? Is in is in the thing, and I was like, oh look, there's Niles Calder, and I, I saw it in the comic, and then I was like, was that in the? I think it was because it's a whole room full of scientists, right? Yeah. One of the sci- one of them is the scientist from the Challengers of the Unknown. Um, the other one is the scientist who created the Metal Men, uh, which you see in. The montage at the end as well. You see that you see the metal men showing up. Um, Dr. Magnus, uh, William Magnus. Um, so he's in that scene as well. But I was like, oh, that's interesting. There's Niles Calder. I wonder if there's any other Doom Patrol people in, in this. And there is a shot of one of the pilots who's attacking the island, who's attacking the center. And he's got his name written across the top of his helmet. And I'm like... You write the guy's name across the top of the helmet. It's got to be somebody, right? Turns out it's Larry Trainer, who is the guy who becomes Negative Man, who was a colleague of Hal Jordan and also a test pilot, um, which is how he became Negative Man that is a member of the Doom Patrol in the first place. And, and some of these characters you're going to start, now that people are learning more about characters like that are from the Doom Patrol, both from Young Justice, but also th- because they've got the live action stuff coming out, you'll, you'll get to see this and see if he's actually... This thing. So there's there's so much stuff still going on even in the in this movie that was trying to trim things down. There's a scene with a boxing match. You actually see like there's a boxing event going on, and it's um I think it's Cassius Clay, who is an actual real world boxer, boxing Ted Grant, who is the former wild wild the superhero Wildcat, who is a member of the Justice Society, and it was Ted Grant's last um last major uh bout after he'd stopped being a superhero. I don't remember this scene, but I believe There's, it. it the, in in the in the comic in the in the comic, it, it's a much bigger thing. Oh, yeah. Like it's a whole thing um, about Ted Grant, and it's right after that fight um, when Captain Cold attacks the ah, Vegas oh, okay. thing, and and Ted's actually there, and he sees Barry, and he makes a comment of like, "Hey, um, I wish my old friend Jay was here," <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. But in the in the actual movie, they show like they gl- you know there's a there's a little quick thing to it, and you hear Ted Grant, I think his name's mentioned, and um, cool. like uh, Cassius Clay like knocks him out. I just must have missed it somewhere out. along the lines. A lot happens in the seventy. There's a lot movie. going on in this exactly. There's a lot going on, right? Um, I was also going to mention the Rick Flag sung thing and the fact that Rick Flag is even in it, and there's uh, you know. This implication that the that the Suicide Squad or Task Force X is there, which is who Rick Flag also led as well. Um, there's the shot of Starro at the end as well, yep. where the Justice League is fighting Starro, which in the classic Justice League um, was one of their early villains as well. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of really cool stuff going on. You've also got a note here that you didn't mention that I want to talk about for a second that is talking about oh, right, the Batman yeah. costume change halfway yeah. through the movie. So this is this is great. This is one of my favorite things. So in the scene we talked about where Martian Manhunter uh, as John Jones, the detective, is trying to break up this cult and they get there and Batman's already taking care of business. Batman's got his old costume on, like even with like the gloves that for some reason randomly don't have the same color as the rest of his costume. I don't even know why he's walking around in these driving gloves. I don't know. It's weird. So and he they stop the cult. But as Batman goes to free this little kid who is going to be sacrificed, the kid's like, you're you're a demon. Get away from me. (laughs) Right. And uh, John's like, I got this right. And walks away with the kid. And so later on, which, again, must be some time jumps later, Superman is in. The Batcave, yes. and he meets he meets Robin for two seconds. Robin's all, they cast for two someone seconds. to play Robin to have two <laughs> lines and have Batman tell him to go do his homework, and I love go it. Go do his homework and have him backflip out of the out of the cave. Um, but Cl- but Clark turns to Bruce and he's like, "New costume, sidekick, 
you got something to tell me? <laughs> and Bruce is like, it's a long story, but let's just say I didn't get in. I got in this. I got into this to scare criminals, not to scare children. And I was like, it's such a good like explanation for this change in the classic costuming that kind of reflects what was happening in the real world where they were like, he's too dark and let's lighten him up and let's, you know, yep. you know, let's bring in Robin and the boy wonder and let's do this stuff. And it was a whole like tone shift, but they're using this like kid having almost been sacrificed and murdered and scared of Batman to affect a tone shift within the continuity of the Batman character. Such and a I good love choice. It. And like that, that little moment with Robin is reflective of near the end. I literally was watching like those last five minutes the first time I'd never seen this, hadn't read the comics. And I'm like, how are they going to get Superman back? Because he's definitely not dead, but how are they going to get him back? And then they just show something starting to bubble up from the ocean. I just went, right. let it be Aquaman. Let it be Aquaman and let there have no explanation. <laughs> just let it be Aquaman showing up. And it is. Right. And it's just like, this is just a thing that happens sometimes. Right. And it's a universe that is so fleshed out, you're willing to just accept that there are people who are here for two lines of dialogue who you only understand, like, if you know this universe, but they're just there. And it's real cool. Right. Well, I've been alluding to a whole bunch of stuff uh, that were in the actual comic, but let me dive into that a little bit deeper. Let's go. uh, And we'll do our once in future past. See, I know stuff only a future boy would know. Dick Grayson, Tim Drake, Garfield Logan. Your name's Tim? And yours is Dick? Oops, spoilers. This secret identity thing is so retro. So in Once or Future Past, we're discussing how the comics that inspired the movies um, may have been altered or changed and whatnot. And I've made I've already made a bunch of references to to so much stuff that's going on. But the comic has even more heroes because that has time to actually do stuff. Like the reason they have Oh, God. So there's a whole one of the many subplots is Adam Strange is in Arkham Asylum (laughs) because he's crazy spaceman. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So the government like gets a hold of him, puts him in Arkham because they think he's crazy because he's talking about the center and about all this weird space stuff. And um, the scene where he shows up for the first time is them releasing him from Arkham going, sorry. (laughs) <laughs> you were right. And Adam and he gets his costume back and Adam's like Adam's like, you know, thanks for the uh thanks for the con- thanks for letting me keep the magazine. And I'm like, well, that's weird. Turns out the next scene, he's flying to go find Palmer because he had read this magazine about Palmer's, he'd read a science science magazine breaking down Palmer's research about how he had created this lens out of white dwarf material to shrink stuff, but it becomes unstable and blows up and he's like and so it's Adam Strange who shows up on Ray Palmer's do- doorstep and brings him uh, to Cape Canaveral to to instigate this whole plan, right? So there's just oh, – there's great. so much going – there's so much going on, right? I talked about this doctor – like the Phantom Stranger has a, you know, brunch, <laughs> creates an, an interdimensional brunch with uh, Dr. Fate and the Spectre. And Phantom Stranger, all three of them were part of the Justice Society, and Zatanna, a full-grown Zatanna, like a little kid Zatanna, and then just Billy Batson, who's sitting there eating ice cream, is and it, Zatanna's like... Is it Billy Batson, or is it Captain Marvel? No, it's Billy, it's Billy, <laughs> and he's sitting there, and at one point, I think the whole scene ends with Zatanna going, don't eat your ice cream so fast, Billy, and he's like, yes, Miss Zatanna, and that's... And of course, you know, yeah, it's just so funny, but there's, there's so many, like they pull in... They pull in so many things in the background. Um, at one point, when Faraday is – when Martian Manhunter is captured and Faraday is talking to Martian Manhunter and they're doing the thing with the chess set and why are you still here and blah, blah, blah. They're like, I want you to help us. And he's like, I'm here to help. And as they're walking out, Vandal Savage is in a cage and he's like, he's, he's like, Faraday, I've been to this island. You need my help. And he's like – no and then he like turns around and just like leaves oh god i need to read this <laughs> he's like i've been there i know this island it's an old friend or whatever it's i don't know what vandal's saying friend. but he's yeah i don't know he said i've been to the island and i know what's up and um right um the talk in the movie between lois and superman uh that are when they're up on top of the daily planet building and she's saying like you know the world needs a leader 
right? And they're talking about McCarthy and a bunch of other stuff. That in the comic, that act, that conversation doesn't happen between Superman and Lois. It happens between Diana and Clark. Because Superman flies out to Themyscira to talk to convince Diana to come back and, you know, help and come back to the States and do stuff. And she's like, yeah, life isn't the way that it is right now. You know, life isn't life isn't good. But I can kind of I can understand seeing why they would change that for the film just because they're they're trying to set up that relationship between Lois and Clark so that they can have that emotional catharsis near the end of them reuniting. You need to have you need to set it up so you can knock it down. And this is a really interesting point because it kind of shows us how in the in the comic, it shows us how we've talked about this kind of rule of three, right? You introduce something a couple of times so that you can have an emotional punch, yeah. right, with whatever it is. The comic fails at that because even though Lois shows up a bunch of times, there is no moment where they're really together until she's crying after he dies, in the comic. But in the movie, they they use this, that that moment, and switch it to her so that you can introduce her the first time, the second time she's reporting and she breaks down crying. And then, you know, Aquaman shows up and says, this one's been asking for a woman named Lois, you know? And then you're like, yeah. So there's that rule of three gets implemented in the movie. They actually fixed it. Yeah. Or they actually decided to go with that to get you that emotional punch. Otherwise, Lois doesn't have as much. You have to rely too much on your understanding of the Superman lore. And you shouldn't have to do that to watch the movie. Like it can be helpful, but you shouldn't have to do that. And so they kind of tweak that, which I really liked a lot. And it gives it like and they let her have her moment at the beginning when she's the radio announcer that mentions the ceasefire and they have her on the news again to set that up to have Superman be like, oh my God, she's out near a giant flying island and I'm going to go be worried about her. Uh, (laughs) And so it works so well. I'm glad to know they fixed that. Yeah. Then they did some other stuff too, which I found was really interesting is it's like they read the comic and said, this scene is really cool that this character is in, but we can't put this character in the movie. So we should, but but maybe we can use this scene. So in the in the movie, uh, John Jones is kind of being taken over by the center uh, psychically, and he's shape changing himself into all these monsters, right? Because the center is just crawling into his head. Well, Faraday at some point gets grabbed by one of the monsters, and he's getting pulled away, and he's trying to help John, um, and then he's going to get eaten by. A, monstrous Tyrannosaurus Rex analog and Faraday pulls two pins out of grenades, goes down the thing's throat and it blows its head off with these grenades in the, in the comic, not, not in the movie. So in the comic Faraday dies when he psychically pulls the center takes, takes the burden of the center's psychic trauma on John onto himself like their link, I guess. I don't know. He doesn't have powers that I'm aware of. Like how, it's a little, how? it's a little weird. It's a little weird, but they kind of imply. It seems like they imply that Faraday and John have a psychic link. Like they have a, this friendship thing. <laughs> it's it's a really it's a little strange. I don't. I, I agree with you, but he fries himself. Yeah. And basically kills himself to help John, and then John goes full. What do we, what do we call Miss Martian? Uh, ter- Bene- benevolent benevolent demigod benevolent demigod yeah he goes benevolent de- demigod on everything um he's like i've been holding myself back i'm done with that now <laughs> and then he just like starts destroying stuff all over the place but here's the thing that scene where faraday is jumping into the mouth of this tyrannosaurus rex with the grenades actually happens at the beginning of the comic because the beginning of the comic is this is the tale of the losers And it's how the losers end up on the island that becomes the center. And the main character, Johnny Cloud, who's uh, uh, this Navajo uh, soldier, uh, that's how he dies. It's to save Rick Flagg, to help Rick Flagg get off the island. He thinks that there's just like one monster on the island, not a million of them. Um, And so he's going to kill this Tyrannosaurus Rex and he jumps into its mouth with a couple of grenades. So that scene is pulled directly from the comic. It's just applied to a completely different character to actually make that character's sacrifice seem a little bit more like it makes some sense. I don't know where this thing was where Faraday pulls the psychic thing out of John. It's 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 interesting. Yeah. Um, There's also another interesting thing, too, where there's the scene where 
uh, Hal and Ace are inside the um, the center, and they're going to bomb it, right? The part where the where monster's Hal... strong enough to change the art style. Right, right. <laughs> it, it uses its power to change the art style. The... <laughs> I love that. It's a great description. We're like, we're going to go into Kirby over here for a minute. So uh, where Howl, like, in, it fully evokes, like, the in, invokes the power of the ring and is able to save Ace, right? In the comic, Nathaniel Adams is also with them. Oh, really? So there's there's actually three bombers that go in. It's Howl, it's Ace, and it's Captain Adam before he's Captain Adam. And so Hal is able to save Ace, but he can't get to to Captain Adam before he blows up a nuclear weapon inside an alien <laughs> ship, basically, which is kind of his origin in the first place. And so if they I, I think they continued on with the series for a little while after this one main uh, issue, one main issue. I think they did. some This more was, stuff, a but it was a six part ish series, I think uh, was for DC New Frontier. I think it was a six issue miniseries. It's either it was like six or twelve, something like that. Might have been six. I bought two volumes of it, but I felt like they were long. Each volume was longer than three issues. I, I don't know. I have to go back and check. Award-winning six-issue comic book limited series, oh, written and drawn by Darwin Cook, and published by DC Comics in two thousand four. Very nice. Thanks, Internet. It was lovely. It was lovely. Thank you, Internet. Um. Anyway, great lead into Nathan Ad Nathaniel Adams because he. He hit his manual, you know, release for the for the weapons, and they all blew up. So there's just so, there's so much stuff going on. Like I mentioned before, after there, there's several pages devoted to that fight, but uh, that last final fight with for Ted Grant, and then he's in the he's in the the bar when Captain Cold's there, and he makes the comment about Jay Garrick, and um, actually Selena's there. So it's. How it's Selena, Bruce. Oh, actually, it's Selena. They're in. Okay, so hold on. Let me get this straight. I just, I just at the fight (laughs) at Selena at Ted at Ted Grant's fight. Yes, in the audience is Bruce and Ollie, and Selena, and Dinah. So. The Black Canary that you see at the end in the Titans is the daughter of the original Black Canary, and she is in the comic briefly because Dinah and, Dinah and Selena are having a conversation. Ollie's being obnoxious, and Bruce is making excuses for him being obnoxious. Um, but then afterwards, they all go to the bar that Captain Cold attacks, and then Flash shows up, and they don't have to do anything because Flash showed up. So... um Selena at some point, I think Selena knows that Ted Grant is Wildcat because she makes a she makes a comment about it. She like kisses him on the cheek and says he's the last of the Wildcats or something like that and kisses him on the cheek. Oh, everything about this makes me so happy. Just that double date pair would be hilarious and I <laughs> yeah, want all be. of it. I right. I also just love anytime. Darwin Cook gets to to write or draw Selena because he's the guy who reinvented the way Selena Kyle looked in comics and gave us yep. whatever Selena Kyle is wearing now in comics is a direct result of what Darwin right. Cook did and it's fantastic. Yeah, and you know he, he clearly put her in there out of love, you know. But there's there's so much going on, guys, and and it gets real deep into um, the whole. Um, the John Wilson thing is just heartbreaking when you see it and the little girl like turning on him and turning him in. And there's, if you think the movie is heavy, has some heavy stuff. The, the, the comic has some heavy stuff too. It is a little frenetic. <laughs> he is, they are trying to get a lot of stuff in at once. Don't have this be your first introduction to the DC universe. Yeah, not so much because there's so many references like the Ted, like you'd be like, why are we watching this boxing match? I don't understand this at all. (laughs) You wouldn't, you wouldn't know. It doesn't make sense. So that's why they cut it for the movie because you can make a reference to it. It's not critical to the plot. You know what I mean? But yeah, that kind of thing. So there's a lot going on. It's well worth the read. The artwork is 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 stunning. It's going to be a little bit different than the movie, but I think that they did some really good tightening of the storyline to make the movie make sense. They trimmed a bunch of characters out. 
like I said, June, who's one of the uh, one of the other challenges of the unknown at some point, she's like tending to Martian Manhunter. And so she's there. And um, so you just got other characters that are like I said, Selena and, and uh, Dinah make an appearance at some point. And yeah, so there's there's a lot going on there. But it's uh, but it's great. I think it's a good to, to wrap it up. I said I, I think it's a good comparison of looking at a really entertaining high concept comic and then translating that to a movie that you need to tighten a bit and trim a bit, right? Yeah. You get to see that they looked at it and went, okay, this lowest thing doesn't make a lot of emotional punch. We've got to put, we've got to change something around early on, right? It's a good way of, of getting a good example of how to additional drafts are important of whatever you're writing to make sure that everything leads to the thing that you want it to lead to. And just in how comics and film are a different medium. You can't always yep. get the same things to work. You can fit a lot more into a six issue comic series than you can into a 70 minute movie, depending on how you are writing yep. that six issue comic series. So sometimes you got to do it. Yet you can, you can still homage to it too. Yes. There are scenes directly like still shots that are directly pulled from the comic. The, the thing you're talking about with how throwing it into space there's, it slows down at one point and you, you're, I'm like, that's got to be a panel from the comic. And when I went to reread it again, I was like, yep, there it is. There's the exact panel from the comic, right? So you can do it and honor the art style and the yeah. animation and that kind of stuff while still making it a, a tight standalone movie by itself. And and it's it's worth doing. It's amazing. Um, and with that, um, I think we can wrap up this mission and Zeta on out of the Watchtower. Yeah. The best way to support our show, of course, is to share it with a friend. You can also leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. Ratings and reviews push us up in the search strings to help new people find the show. Uh, and don't forget that you can find all of our episodes now. In addition to where I talked about at the beginning of this episode, you can find us on YouTube, crashingthemode.com slash YouTube, uh, with, of course, huge thanks to Ryan Bolter and Richard Kreutz Landry for helping us make that happen. You can find links to more information about this movie, its related comics, and other material down in the show notes. This is also this movie is also available on DC Universe, so if you are all signed up for that, waiting for Young Justice Outsiders to come out, you can just click on over to the Movies tab and check this out. I think that's how both of us watched it. And if you enjoyed this episode and want to see more bonus content like this, please consider supporting us through Patreon at www.patreon.com slash crashing the mode. You can also find just the first issue, apparently, of the six-issue miniseries on DC Universe. So you can check it out. I um, bought the rest of it on... I have the original copies, but they're buried somewhere. So I uh, bought the rest of it on Comixology. But you can check out the first issue to see what I'm talking about, about the differences, what we're saying about the differences between the comic and the show. And of course, remember... Stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Well